You may inform the Secretary of the Royal Society that I have entitled my Michaelmas lecture Darwin's Fundamental Error. That'll raise a few hackles, sir. <laughs> Will it not? I must be off. You can uh, acknowledge uh, all of these. There's a good job. Thank you. Father? My dear. Did you hear how Roy barked last night? It was dreadful. No, no, I didn't. Did you hear him, Bennett? I can't say it, did, sir. He kept on and on. He howled, too. I'm sure someone got into the garden. An intruder? Well, yes, because... Oh, Father. Someone looked in at me. At my window. Impossible. You must have been dreaming. Oh, Edith. Nobody could reach your window. It's far too far off the ground. I am sure I wasn't dreaming. Bennett, you take charge. Or I shall be late for the faculty meeting. I leave you in your fiancé's care, my dear. If he proves as good a husband to you as he has amanuensis to me, you'll be a fortunate woman. I lay her fears, Bennett. I know you can. Can you believe me? Not easily, no. I mean, as your father said... Come and look. I'm awfully busy. I've got these notes on Simis Satyrus, the type, and then the proof of your father's... Jack, I know I wasn't dreaming. And you know Roy doesn't bark at nothing. I want you to see for yourself. You must, please. And then, after the barking woke me, I heard another sound. From just below here. From below? There. And there. Do you see? The ivy's pulled away. I must have fainted. The next thing I knew, it was dawn. You're quite, quite certain you didn't dream this, Edith? Quite. Jack, I insist you believe me. Very well. And that you inform Sherlock Holmes of the facts. Oh, darling. Or I shall reconsider our engagement. But why? I could not give my hand to a man who doubts my word. Thank you.
Watson. Come at once, if convenient. If inconvenient, come all the same. Holmes, I got your note. And it is inconvenient. Damned inconvenient. Your old wound is troubling you. No. I prefer to differ. Your step was uneven on the stairs. I have a full surgery, Holmes. So you must excuse a certain abstraction of mind, Watson. I see. It's a tangled scheme. I've been mean, looking for a loose end which might unravel it. One such might reside in the question... Does Professor Presbury's daughter wake or dream? I'm summoned here for no more than this. You've heard of Presbury? Of course, who hasn't? He's our most distinguished natural scientist. He's a widower with one daughter. She assists someone appeared at her window last night. Miss Presbury's bedroom is on the second floor and it's completely inaccessible to even the most agile cat burglar. Read this. Arrived by the one o'clock post. Ah. The author already arrived. He's ahead of his time. The most precipitate young man. Mr. Bennett, my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Mr. Bennett. Please sit down. Uh, no, forgive me. I, uh... Mr. Holmes, I fear I've made a grave error of judgment. I should not have been in touch with you at all. I've wasted your time entirely. You discovered a rational reason for Miss Presbury's fears. No, no, I can't say that. Well, it's a, it's a delicate matter, but I, I must beg you to proceed no further. I can, of course, recompense you. Mr. Bennett, your letter was less than frank, was it not? I set out the facts. Not all, I suspect. Probably out of loyalty to your fiance, Miss Presbury. You're aware of that? as I am of your employer's engagement to Miss Alice Morphy, the daughter of the famous comparative anatomist. She resides next door to the Presbyters, does she not? How do you know of the engagement? The Times, July the 1st, September the 5th, respectively. Mr. Holmes' memory is of a photographical order. Quite so. Oh, dear. Mr. Bennett, I do appreciate your predicament. As a scientist and a rationalist yourself, I dare say you're reluctant to accept the evidence insisted upon by Miss Presbury. Further, as a father's trusted assistant, to have recourse to me must smack to you of disloyalty. Exactly. I'm part of the family, except that Edith and Miss Presbury, she was so upset that she... Mr. Bennett, who would you prefer to alienate? Your prospective wife or her celebrated father? You give me a choice of evils. Neither. Then furnish me with the facts and I will see how I can help you. You may rely on the discretion of both of us. Well. Would you, for example, describe Miss Presbury as an impressionable or fanciful girl? No, quite the reverse. Miss Alice Morphy. Perhaps Professor Presbury's engagement to her came to you as something of a surprise. He is, after all, three times her age. And this balloon? I prefer that one with the osprey feathers. Could you ask him, do you think? Father's extremely proud of his orchids. I hate them. They're so, oh, I don't know, so impure somehow. Do please ask him not to send them anymore. There's a sweet friend, Edith, please. Can you not ask him? I couldn't. I daren't, I'm such a coward. Well, oh, please. You've got so much more character than me. You're as strong as he. But, Alice, if you dare not ask this of my father, how will you ever manage those deeper conflicts that occur even in the happiest of marriages? Oh, I don't know. I'm so frightened. Of marrying my father? I wish... No, please don't ask. Let's not speak of it. What do you think of this one? Well, neither Miss Presbury nor I consider her father's infatuation with Miss Morphy to be entirely appropriate. Rather excessive. And her parents had no objections to the marriage? The professor is a respectable widower. And a wealthy man. Oh, 
When may I call? Call? To view Miss Presley's window. To determine for myself its accessibility or otherwise to an intruder. Shall we say 11 o'clock tomorrow morning? Professor Presbury will be at his college. That's of no matter. At present, my inquiries are purely logistical. I have never had any secrets from the professor. Mr. Bennett, let me refer you to your first question, which you have, in fact, answered. You're more inclined to Miss Presbury's party than you are to your employers. Yes, yes, I dare say. Thank you. Good day. Good day. Holmes, you're prying into the affairs of a perfectly respectable family. Why is Bennett so reluctant to tell the truth? Loyalty. It's as plain as a pike staff. Let us hope so. Yet he wrote to me under duress. You notice his handwriting? The crossing of the T's with such deep indentation. And then upon his arrival, his endeavours to call the whole thing off. No, there's more to this than meets the eye. I do not agree. This case is unworthy of you. I must return to my surgery. Maybe I'll see you tomorrow. Just to slept better. Oh, yes. Last night I removed to the guest bedroom. Oh, no need, surely. It was but an ugly dream. Father, Alice has asked me. Yes? The truth is, she does not care for orchids. She doesn't? Well, why did she not say so? Well, she was afraid to. You forget how formidable you are, Father. <sighs> the silly girl. Well, then she shall have roses. Yes, two dozen red roses. Boy was quiet enough last night. Not to rouse him, sir. Docility itself. Mark change, MacPhail. Aye. He's grown accustomed to his shackles. The poor beast. Shall we go up? If Miss Presbury has no objection. I understand the necessity. Let us lead the way, my dear. I'm glad you're by yourself today, Watson. You were a veritable bear yesterday. Touch liverish, perhaps. This is where the figure appeared? Yes. There's no ladder on the premises that could reach this height? No. Was the window ajar? Yes. I keep the door locked. Did the hand touch the window pane? I don't know. I fainted. Of course you did. No, it's a formidable elevation. Yet the ivy is strong. Pedro Allegriensis. Torn away just here. Ah. Miss Presbyter, your father has returned prematurely. No. He mustn't know you're here, Mr. Holmes. That can scarcely be avoided. However, let us go down. The back stairs? Certainly not. Bennett, what did you do in my lecture? Who the devil are you, sir? Father, I'm sorry. It's the Sherlock Holmes. Who? The detective. Professor Presbury. My card. Two hundred and twenty-one B. 
hardly an address to inspire confidence. I've never sought to inspire confidence in others. I have quite enough of my own. May I introduce my colleague, Dr. Watson? Certainly not. You may leave it once the pair of you. Father, they are here at our request. But not mine, Edith. And you, Bennett. You should have consulted me before resorting to such methods. A common detective and his accomplice. Really. Now, sir, allow me to escort you from the premises. My assistant had no authority to engage you in this matter. Kindly inquire into it no further. Should you persist, I shall have no hesitation in calling the police. The strait of the yard is well known to me, so beware. I would not hesitate in calling the strait, Professor, if you wish to have the mystery solved. There is no mystery, sir. None. Now be gone with you. Or would you have me release my dog? Believe me, you'll not distinguish between a hired snoop and a low intruder. Or would you be gone, sir, will you? We shall, sir, we shall. But you are over the mark. Kindly watch your words. As a breed, despite their ferocious appearance, such dogs are seldom vicious. I'm surprised that Roy needs chaining at all. Unless it is for your safety as much as I. The dog reflects family life, Watson. Does it indeed? Who ever heard of a frisky dog in a gloomy home? Or a sad dog in a happy one? Snarling people have snarling dogs. Have you observed the presence of his Irish wolfhound as well as I? He growled quite as much as his master as it is us, two complete strangers. That animal did not reserve its animosity solely for the professor. Well, we'll seek verification from young Bennett when he arrives. I said word by way of Jock McPhail after our meeting at the Goat and Compasses. Another of your agents, Holmes? The president is coachman. Just charge of Roy. I joined him last night for what he calls a wee goldie. Oh, here's Bennett, precipitate as ever. Come in! Good morning. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. I must apologize for your unfortunate encounter yesterday. But also... There's no need. In fact, it has provided the very first clue to this odd affair. Do sit down. Thank you. Mr. Holmes, I cannot pretend I'm happy to have answered your summons. Well, of course. And I continue to appreciate the division of your loyalties. It's no small wonder that you have withheld so much. Roy first attacked his master on the evening of September the 2nd, did he not? How can you know that? As the professor came from his study into the hall, you restrained the dog. On this occasion, he was merely shut up in the scullery. Next morning, he was as right as rain, or Sir MacPhail informs me. MacPhail? Who better than the family coachman to advise me how matters might truly stand? Forgive me, Mr. Holmes, I should have told you myself, but... But you didn't. The second attack occurred 13 days later. Again, the professor was in the hall. Fortunately, this time he was able to put the study door between himself and the altered animal, was he not? Edith wanted Roy chained from that moment. But her father overruled her. He insisted that he was still a dear, affectionate dog, that he wasn't congenitally vicious. But not after the third attack. No, he did agree then that he had to be restrained. And Roy was banished to the chain in the stable yard. Yes. MacPhail believes that the change in Roy's behavior stems from about two months ago. I think it may have. I, I didn't keep a strict note of it. Consult your fiancé, Bennett, and MacPhail. The precise log of these events may yet prove pertinent. I observed that the professor lectures at the university at two o'clock this afternoon. I shall call then. No! I couldn't possibly agree! No! Bennett, Miss Presbyter did not dream. Someone or something looked in upon her. It is my conviction that your fiancé is in grave danger. From whom? No, sir. From whom? Or from what? Mr. 
Secretary, you handle the professor's correspondence. Oh, yes, it's my responsibility to open every letter. Has it always been Miss Presbyter's habit to lock her bedroom door at night? Um, uh, no, well, it, well, well, she told me that... Yes? It was after Roy began to behave so strangely. That she too became afraid of the dog? Mr. Holmes, you mustn't touch his desk. Get it! Thank you. Inform me of the correspondence the professor had with someone called Dorak. Inhabiting corn lead. Oh, no, no, no. Commercial road, of course, you see. It would appear that the professor answers such correspondence himself. Well, again, um... Again, you've been reluctant to speak. Yes. Some... Eight weeks ago, he told me that certain missives might arrive from East Central marked by a cross under the stamp. The code? And did they? Regularly? Irregularly. I was to leave them unopened and speak of them to no one. You said missive. They were not letters. Well, some were. Others were small packets. And did you observe Professor Presby's replies? No. They didn't pass through my hands. Yet the evidence would suggest that he did respond. To the Hindu, the dog is a traditional enemy of the monkey. What was that, Watson? Hmm? What? Nothing. Jack! Oh, I... I wasn't aware. Uh, no, I couldn't tell you. You'd already gone out. I see. I've invited Alice to take tea with us. Do not be too severe upon your fiancé, Miss Presbury. He has acted for the best. And please, will you continue to lock your door at night? The prowler who looked in upon you is no ordinary creature. Good day. Jack, you shouldn't have brought him in here. I didn't want to, but he insisted. He says there's grave danger. Was that Sherlock Holmes? The Sherlock Holmes? Your observation goes to the very heart of this business, Watson. Observation? Considering the monkey and the dog, the very heart of it. Oh, you think so? Now, uh, if you'd be so kind as to accompany me to the university, you can drive on to the commercial road, inquire after Donner. That's not an address, Holmes. The commercial road's a mile long from Allgate East to Limehouse. Then ask a costermonger. Where Donner's shop. Shop? Come on, Watson, I'm going to be late. The equatorial rainforests of Africa, Asia, and Southern America are filled with the sound and movement of a multitude of species from the private family. To go to it, therefore. This um, physical activity, the swinging amongst branches, the uh, flying leaps from treetop to treetop, and loud, raucous calling, not only defines territorial rights in the forest, for example, for food gathering, the tender shoots of tree and shrub are particularly prized, but also is frequently, among the males, a ritual display, either to warn off unwelcome intruders or to uh, impress a particular female with the sexual potential of the performer. Thank you.
good afternoon. Looking for something, are you? Um, I believe there's some livery stables here or nearby. No. No, we've got a knacker's yard next door, that's all. All right. Right you are. It's a dead end cock. Oh, I could see a way through. Yes. Are you a knock or what? Not at all. Art. I'm sorry. I said art. Just can't take an in, can you? I beg your pardon. I said art, and I meant art. No admittance, mate. These are commercial premises. What do you mean by that? I mean it's a shop. Well, it must be early closing day. This is ridiculous. Is it? My dear Lestrade, I am astonished that you, a man of your standing, should call upon so petty an error. Professor Presbury objects most strenuously to your investigations, Mr. Holmes. His complaint is that of unjustified harassment. The justification has yet to be proved. Has Presbury informed you of the facts? Of course. And your conclusions? A girl half asleep mistook a cat or a bird or both for an intruder. <laughs> That's all. A trifle. Such a simple explanation. However, it begs the question of the family dog, does it not? Does it? What dog? Presby did not mention Roy's part in this affair. Strange. Clearly a partial witness. I suggest you ask him. You're not in full possession of the facts of this complex case. Trust you to say there's more to it than meets the eye, Mr. Holmes. I never concern myself in anything without that stimulus. If you persist, you may find yourself at the wrong end of a private prosecution, you know. Professor Presbury is a determined man. And we're fairly matched, are we not? I knew it. Well, I've said my say. So. That's strange. Right, you can do it. Yeah, easier than Maidstone. <laughs> Poor old fella. One hundred and forty-four. Mm. Commercial Road. Oh, you located Dora. Good. He appears to run a general store, as far as I can tell. He sells everything from flat irons to fish hooks. Can you be more specific? Well, can't be a very prosperous business. Why not? Because the general public are not allowed in. Did you discover anything else? Apart from being threatened by an unhelpful brute in an alley at the side, very little. He obviously works there, because he followed me back to the shop and threatened me again. Oh, there was another fellow, sharply dressed, in our waistcoat, with a moustache. Sherwood? Yes. Yes, he did. Sounds like Harry Wilcox. More usually a Soho Square than the East End. Anything further? No, not really. Except the smell. There's a very odd smell about them. Of what? It's not easy to say. Belong to the animal kingdom. Straw or stables? More like a zoo. You're still up. Yes, sir. I thought I might finish these proofs. Very conscientious of you, but uh, no, no, you get to bed. Oh, I'd rather not, sir. I should like. Get to bed. Go on with you. Yes, sir. Very well. Uh, 
Right, sir. Good night. as your father. Professor Presbury. Father. Sir, sir. What is it? Jack thought he saw. I fancied I, I heard an intruder, sir. You did? Yes, Roy too was exercised, but when I looked out just now, there was Nothing, and he's since quietened down. Listen. But you thought you saw? Well, yes, I, I thought I saw. Yes? An animal. Animal? No. It must have been a trick of light, sir. It must have been. Yes, sir. I was mistaken. My fault. Bennett. Yes, sir. Get some sleep. That's a good chap. Yes, sir. Manifestly, a gang is at work. Other zoological gardens have reported similar thefts. Oh, yeah. My colleagues in Bristol are investigating the theft of two rhesus monkeys and a baboon, removed only last week. A travelling menagerie in Oxfordshire have lost a prized chimpanzee, and Maidstone, their finest gorilla. Big Charlie. Yeah. Delightful chap, and you well. They've all disappeared without a trace. And Mr. Holmes, what's his interest? He insisted to me that this may have relevance to another case he has in hand. We like to indulge him when we can. Uh, find anything to the purpose, Mr. Holmes? Nothing much. Oh, I warned you. My men have been through it with a tooth comb. The lock was released by Swell Jenkins of Stepney Green. The primate was quietened with a plant of chloroform administered by someone who lavishes their hair with Mr. Brewster of German Street's pomade. This would suggest that he also sports a waxed moustache. Mr. Brewster being celebrated for his cosmetic wax for gentlemen. If this were so, Lestrade, you could do worse than have a word with Harry the Tash Wilcox of Soho. Good Lord, Holmes. Oh. You're nothing much. Would be anyone else's a great deal. 
Yes, well, I'm sure my men will arrive at the same conclusion once their reports are behind. You will also naturally have noticed, Lestrade, that this is the sixth reported theft of a mature male primate in as many weeks. Is it? Six? Oh, exceptional. The gender of the animals removed is, I suggest, of the essence. Good day. Come in. My dearest Alice. I'm not interrupting your work. No, no. I wasn't seriously engaged. Just some notes of future inquiry, nothing more. Shall we go through to the drawing room? This is hardly the place to entertain a young lady. No. Oh, dear. My dear child, what is the matter? I ought to have said before. What you? What? There. You must take it back. Oh, Alice. I can't marry you. I shouldn't have said I would, but I was afraid to say no. Please take it back. Nonsense. This is simply a... No. You must take it. There. I'm sorry. Alice! No! You're old. You're too old. So Bennett actually saw the intruder's shadow inside the house. But upon investigation, you could find no further trace. You must get close to him by way of the butcher's boy. Are you coming? Where to? Dorax Emporium. Especially those past swell Jenkins took such pains to guard against you. Are you game? Delighted. You go armed? Always carry a firearm east of Allgate, Watson. Threatening on a visit, Mr. Holmes. Wilcox! <laughs> Jenkins. This is what I smelt. These are Dorex patients, poor abused creatures. Have you observed the experiments that Dorak performs on them? Oh, no, that's none of our business, he says. You can't yourself fortunate that the process has been kept from you. Now, gentlemen, in you go. In there, with him? Why? To await the police. In, gentlemen. We should advise. Inspector Lestrade at once. You can't leave us in here! Remember the gorilla is a social animal. And if you both mind your manners, you will do well enough, I dare say. 
Ah, uh, Mr. Bennett and Miss Presbury. Yes. I decided I had to accompany Jack, Mr. Holmes. I'm delighted. Have you brought the list of missing dates? Yes. Uh, Roy also barked on these nights. Please, never mind that, Mr. Holmes. We have far more urgent matters to impart. Is that so? Miss Morphy has renounced my father. She's returned his ring? Today, since when he has remained locked in his study. Every time I've knocked, he shouted abuse at me. We, we fear. The logic of it, Watson, for this progression, do you see it? Please. The first three occasions are self-evident. We know of those. What happened on the 5th of October? Roy barked all night. And on the 12th, too. There are also days upon which the professor received packages from London East Central. This is the date on which the face appeared at the window four nights ago? Yes. And this is where the shadow appeared last night? Of course! The common factor is two. Always the gap decreases by two days. Numbskulls. And today is the 21st of October. Did? Yes. Package arrived this morning. And the crisis is upon us. Last night was but the precursor. Come here, Miss Go at once. Come along, come along. I'll explain on the way. Close thing. Just missed the carotid artery. Is he all right? He'll live. A reformed man, I have no doubt, after his experience. 
My dear Lestrade, I quite intended you to have the credits, but to complete the case against Dorak, Wilcox, and Jenkins, you'll need this. Here is the incontrovertible proof that those animals you've rescued from degradation were stolen for the sake of their glands. The animal extract will be sold at enormous profit to those foolish or desperate enough to imagine that a course of serum could restore their lost vitality without any other effects. I am grateful to you, Mr. Holmes. Thanks to you, we've traced the evil to its source. Perhaps, but poor Tresbury. When one tries to rise above nature, one is liable to fall below it. The highest type of man may revert to the animal when he leaves the straight road of destiny. Yes, well, I'll leave the philosophy to you, Mr. Holmes. Quite the best, Lestrade, I always do. Is the wolf hound to be destroyed? Oh, no. No, it was the monkey that Roy attacked, not the man. But the dog would be himself again quite as much as his master. Well, thank you both. Good day, gentlemen. Good day, Lestrade. If I may say so, Holmes, I think you went a little too far in allowing Lestrade all the credit. Not all, Watson. You can find it away in our archives. One day, the entire truth can be told. 